much for that lovely introduction. Um, we're here tonight to talk about these guys, superbugs. And it's estimated that superbugs kill 25,000 Europeans each year. And if they don't kill you, they make you very sick. Uh, if you get an infection with a superbug, you're likely to be in hospital for longer, it's going to be more difficult to treat, and your recovery may actually take much longer. So, Fidelma, can you tell us a little bit more about what might happen if we don't actually get in control of the superbugs? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's not very pleasant. Um, this report was published late last year in the UK, and they asked the question, what would happen if we did nothing by the year 2050? And this is very interesting, um, because I find graphs very difficult to follow, so I could understand this. And I was really shocked by this. They said 10 million people would die every year because of superbugs. That's the AM orbit by 2050. Now, to put that into context, we hear a lot of talk about diabetes, that'll be 1.5 million, road traffic accidents, 1.2 million, and cancer, 8.2 million. So it's not belittling the other causes, but superbugs and their issues are a real problem. And what this report said is that no country is immune. We all have to tackle this together. So let's go back in time. We've started in the future, and let's go back from the future to Cork in the 1930s. Um, but this is a fairly typical scene um, uh, from Cork in the 1930s. Um, and this young uh, um, boy here, John, what happened to John shortly after this picture was taken was John became ill. Uh, he developed um, a, a chesty cough and very quickly it turned into pneumonia and he was admitted to hospital, but he never came home. He died. Um, and it's very important that we actually don't forget what it was like in the area before antibiotics. We had large families, and one of the reasons why we had large families, apart from contraception, obviously, uh, was because it was very common for one, if not two children, to die for, in each family from infections like skin infections, tonsillitis, pneumonia, meningitis. And these are the um, records um, from the um, RCSI, and they're from the uh, North Charitable um, Infirmary, which was an old hospital, and these go back to 1919. And you can see here, people went into hospital, but they died with pneumonia, pneumonia, bronchitis. We don't expect people to die from those things these days. We certainly didn't expect. Um, <coughs> Uh, and, and if you look at the um, mortality, this is, this is the causes of death in Ireland and how they've changed over the last century. What you can see is here in 1945, with the introduction of penicillin, a massive fall off in deaths from infectious disease. Now obviously there were a few other things involved there because uh, we had better hygiene, we, had, we, we became uh, you know, uh, better nutrition, um, better sanitation. But if you look at, look at the, the reduction in mortality that we've had and things we spend an awful lot of money on, cancer care, um, care of people with chronic uh, chest conditions, care of people with uh, heart disease, and we've, we've improved the mortality from those, but nothing like as dramatic as what has happened with the introduction of antibiotics and the reduction in deaths from infections. And the reality is, is that nowadays, this little girl here, or any of these three children, <coughs> if they got pneumonia, they'd come to see me as a GP, and I'd give them an antibiotic, and they'd go home, and I'd give their parents some advice, and I'd, I'd check up on them. But seven days later, they'd be better. And it, it's very important that we don't forget that, that it's not so long ago since that was not the outcome that you would expect from a chest infection. So, Fidelma, Fidelma's 
we'd like for Donna to tell us a little bit more about these antibiotics and, and miracle drugs. I mean, I've left you know a little bit about how they've changed how I as a GP would practice versus a GP back in the 1930s. But in hospitals, Fidelma, mm -hmm. how, what difference have they made? Well, I suppose the first thing to say, and it's not overstating it, is modern healthcare is totally dependent on antibiotics. So let me take you on a ward round of a, probably a typical ward round in Beaumont Hospital. So if I walk into any ward in the hospital, probably one of the first type of patients I'd see would be somebody that's a day or two post-op. So let's say they'd appendicitis or diverticular disease. What happens around the time of the operation is the anaesthetic and surgical team give an antibiotic before the surgeon cuts. And the reason they do that is to make sure there's a high concentration of an antibiotic in the person's bloodstream to kill any bugs that might escape when the surgeon cuts over the bowel. So this type of surgery just can't happen without antibiotics. So we do this all the time. The next type of patient I might see in Beaumont is a cancer patient. So cancer patients, both by their cancer and also for the treatment of their cancer, be it chemotherapy or radiotherapy, are very susceptible to infection. So their immune systems are working very well. And our immune systems like the army. We need our army to fight infection. And antibiotics are needed for these patients to prevent infection and also to treat infection. So again, these patients would die if it was not for antibiotics. We're in a hurry now in the ward round. <laughs> no, this is one of your patients. So I would often see patients that are a little bit older, that come into Beaumont, that may have been treated by their GP for a kidney infection or a chest infection, and they just haven't got better on tablet antibiotics, so they need a drip antibiotic, and that kind of makes sense. Because with a drip antibiotic, you can get a big high dose to kill all those bugs. Again, these sometimes very vulnerable patients, they'd be dead without antibiotics. And then lastly, just to fly the flag for Beaumont, we're the National Transplant Centre. Transplantation of any sort, never mind a kidney or whatever, it just simply wouldn't happen without antibiotics. First of all, because of the surgery, you need the antibiotic to prevent the infection. Second of all, if these vulnerable patients get infections, you need antibiotics. And lastly, a lot of these patients, because they're so vulnerable to infections, take long-term antibiotics to stop certain types of infection. So I think it's certainly not overstating it that my life in Beaumont would be very different without antibiotics. Actually, I might be unemployed now. <laughs> um, so I'd like now uh, uh, to come to the present day uh, in the community and just to, to illustrate, I suppose, a tale um, of two countries um, in uh, the continent of Europe. So these are two friends, um, Mary and Josephine, who've been friends all their life, and, and they um, both recently retired. And they decided to go on a walking holiday in Norway. And what happened is they were out on this kind of more rocky kind of road, and Mary actually slips and falls, and she grazes her leg. So they clean it up, and she goes to bed, uh, that night, she gets up the next morning and actually it's quite painful and it's getting red around it and it's throbbing a bit and they think, I think we better really go and get this seen. So they go to the local emergency department um, and Mary is actually, it's cleaned up and Mary's prescribed an oral, a tablet antibiotic called flucloxacillin. She's given it for 10 days. After about 48 hours she feels an awful lot better and they're able to continue on with their walking holiday. In the meantime, this other retired couple, John and Brida, they decide to go back to where they went to their honeymoon. They go back to Greece. And they're walking along the beach in Greece, and suddenly John ends up catching her, his foot on something, and he gets a small cut. Same story, he goes to bed, he wakes up the next morning, it's throbbing, it's a bit red, it's a bit sore, and he thinks, no, I think we better go and we'll get this seen. But he goes to an emergency department in Greece, and something different happens. He gets admitted to hospital, and he gets put on a drip, um, and an intravenous antibiotic, for a whole two weeks. So Fidelma, why do you think that these two people, with the same um, condition, are treated so differently in two European countries, not in the minds apart? Well, 
It's all to do with the Superbugs, no surprise, it's the title of the talk. But not every country is the same, and this is not an economic map of Europe. This is the Superbug map of Europe. And the bottom line with this map is if you are in green, you have low rates of Superbugs, and if you are in red, you have high rates of Superbugs. And if you have any colour in between, it's in between high and low. So Norway, this is going to see a test, I'm glad she has the pointer. Norway <laughs> um, has low rates of superbugs. And that's, what that means in practice for a doctor is there's a very good chance tablet antibiotics will work. So that's why that couple were prescribed tablet antibiotics in Norway. Whereas Greece have very high rates of superbugs. And we find this later in the talk that that means in practice for us as doctors that most of the antibiotics don't work. There's most of the tablet antibiotics certainly don't work. And you generally need drip antibiotics. So that's why the exact same situation in two very different countries, one gets tablets, the other gets drip, it's all to do with the superbugs. And there's an interesting parallel, isn't there, Lula, with the, the next map? Sorry. At first glance, this might look like the same map. But here we're talking about different things. Because here we're talking about the amount of antibiotics that are consumed per head of population. And again, green is good, because green means that they use very little antibiotics per head of population. Dark red, look at Greece down there, means they produce, use a lot more antibiotics per head of population. In fact, um, uh, Greece uses three times more antibiotics per head of population than Norway. And Ireland is somewhere in between. So you can see the connection that we're beginning to lead you towards here about how we might start to tackle this problem. So I suppose when you talk about antibiotic use in Ireland, it's worth reminding us of some facts. So antibiotics are really commonly used in, Ant in Ireland. One in three hospital patients at any one time are on an antibiotic. So that means one in three of the 800 patients in Beaumont or whatever. Also, if you're a resident in a long-term care facility in Ireland, you're twice as likely to be prescribed an antibiotic as being a resident in any other. So this is a study we did in Ireland, and one in ten of Irish patients in long-term care facilities are on antibiotics, as opposed to one in four, one in five, you can see my maths isn't great, in other European countries. The other thing we found when myself and Lula started working together is we did a survey of Irish adults and we asked the question in the last year, how many of you have taken an antibiotic? So these are healthy people and again one in three of them and I thought that was really high. So we do use a lot of antibiotics in Ireland. Um, what exactly are antibiotics? I thought you'd never ask me. <laughs> so antibiotics are not domestos. We're going to talk about domestos later on. They're very, very specific medications. So when we talk about superbugs and bugs, we're really talking about bacteria. So bacteria are bugs that cause infections like kidney infections, there's a bug called E. coli, we we'll meet later, or skin infections like Staph aureus. So antibiotics work on bacteria. They don't work on fungi, so there are things like, for example, that cause thrush, and they don't work on viruses. There are things that cause the common cold and flu. And even within bacteria, antibiotics are very specific. So an antibiotic that would treat a skin infection doesn't treat a kidney infection or a chest infection, because different bugs cause different types of infection. So that's the first point. They're very, very specific. They're not domestos. Um, and um, we mentioned about um, antibiotics and then antibiotics were discovered. And Fidelma, I wonder for our audience, could you actually try to tell the story of actually how penicillin was discovered? Because I think it's a, it's a fascinating story um, and, and one which needs to be told many times. Well, well, I'd like to thank my colleague at Beaumont, Evan Smith, for actually doing the research on this. But it basically, the clues are holidays, Irish banking, and a chimney. So they are linked. So, Alexander Fleming was the person that discovered antibiotics in 1928. 
And the holiday bit is, he went off on his holidays. And like a lot of us, before you go on your holidays, you're in a bit of a rush. So he worked in a laboratory, and those platy things um, are things you grow bacteria on. So he was doing research on staphylococcal bacteria. So he went off on his holidays, forgot to clear his bench away, so he left all his plates on the bench, minded his own business, came back and went ballistic because his plates were covered with this fungus. So he was about to throw them out and he had a look at the plates and what did he see but something was killing the bacteria and he thought, hmm, is this fungus producing something that's killing off the bacteria? So he went downstairs to the lab below because there was a fella called Latouche working downstairs and he was working on fungi. So it was obviously his fault because there was his fungi that came up via the chimney that connected both of the labs. And when he asked Latouche, what is this thing that's contaminating my plates? And by the way, it looks like it's producing something that's killing my bacteria. Latouche was, oh, that's penicillium. And the banking connection, in case you haven't gathered, is Latouche from Greystones and Latouche, previous the AIB bank. So that's the story of Irish banking holidays in a chimney. So that was very exciting, but it wasn't really until 1940 that a usable product known as penicillin was produced. And there was that gap in 20 years, and it was Florian and Jane, and actually all three of them ended up getting the Nobel Prize for this. And they produced this powder. And almost overnight, there was celebration all over the world. Because Nunes told you about the 1930s, the children dying of simple infections like pneumonia. But look what happened, because around the 1940s, we had the Second World War. And when you compare the death rates between the First World War and the Second World War, there's a dramatic decrease. And of course, there was different things that improved. But antibiotics played such a big part of that. And there was these kind of posters, thanks to penicillin, he will come home, were very common at that stage. And I think it's worth looking back at that picture that Nuna showed at the start, because I'm still very humbled by that drop in mortality because of antibiotics. Like, that's huge. So this certainly was a modern miracle that was produced. Absolutely. Um... And I suppose, Fidella, uh, we thought this was it, didn't we? Well, that's my nephew, Daniel, and he likes, what's that Minecraft thing? But actually, I was telling him about what I was doing, and he decided this was bye-bye books, so he was celebrating. But actually, yeah, people around the world thought, well, that's it. Microbiologists are going to be out of a job. They were wrong. Um, and we have beaten the books. Time is closed. We, we've beaten infectious diseases. Yeah. But un unfortunately... Um, uh, like many things that happen within history, um, it's easy with hindsight to see where we went wrong. But in actual fact, uh, the original discoverer of penicillin had this to say, and if only we had listened to him. Um, I suppose it's also to do with the kind of the, the, the reproductive rate of bacteria. Because to be honest with you, what happens is even if, like antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria, like if you were a bacteria, what would you do? Would you stand in front of an antibiotic and go, kill me, kill me? Or would you do something clever? Yeah. So you would try and develop ways around, and that's what antibiotic resistant is. And on top of that, bugs reproduce very fast. They reproduce faster than we do. So they're constantly trying to adapt and survive. So they're natural survivors. They've been around for billions of years. The demo has very carefully, uh, very cleverly covered up there that I misplaced and I went onto a slide that is further on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it, essentially that's what it is, is that the, the, what um, bacteria do is that they figured out that we were trying to kill them, these antibiotics were trying to kill them, so they suddenly decided, well, we've got to get around these, and, and that's what antibiotic resistance is around. They adapted uh, to that. And initially, it didn't really matter all that much, because if you look at this slide here, and it just, it's important to explain it, the blue here, these are all the new antibiotics, okay? So this is, this is a timeline. So we have the 1940s, we had penicillin, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. This is the timeline for antibiotics. So these are all the new antibiotics. You might recognize some of those names. And, and this here, it, the green is actually resistance. So 
even though when we started to use antibiotics, resistance started to develop to them, we kind of didn't worry all that much because the next year there'd be another new antibiotic and then there'd be another new one. And we really thought it was going to go on forever. We thought this would never end. But unfortunately, it did end. Okay? And you see here this big gap here. Uh, really since the 1970s, we've actually had no new antibiotics. We've kind of moved on to a second generation or a third generation of existing antibiotics. Um, but no new antibiotics, and we'll come back to the reasons for that later on in our, in, in, in our talk. Um, um, so the development of antibiotics really slowed down. And currently, um, we really do feel, and world experts feel, and in particular, this, this week, Professor Martin Corrigan, um, who is one of, our, uh, one of the leading world experts, who's a Galway man, and he has had this to say, um, the time is running out. We have a limited expectations from an Uber pipeline of products. We hope for some modest success, but the existing classes of antibiotics are probably the best we will ever have. And that's a very sobering thought. So, Fidelma um, is going to talk a bit about the WHO Global Report on Antibiotic Resistance, uh, which came out in April of last year and which grabbed headlines right around the world. So WHO is the World Health Organization, and they were one of the first international agencies to basically call this as it was, as in a threat to public health. And there's lots of these type of headlines that have been coming up, but the bottom line is everybody is genuinely concerned that we are at risk of turning back the clock and returning to the pre-antibiotic era. And that is not being alarmist. It's a real threat to public health. And this is the shame. When Alexander Fleming saw this useful powder known as penicillin being produced and all these fantastic discoveries, he warned us. He said stuff like, penicillin should only be used when there's a bacterial infection. I, he said when there's a properly diagnosed reason. And it needs to be used, use the highest possible dose for the shortest possible time, i.e. take it exactly as prescribed, because otherwise the bugs are clever and they're going to develop resistance and we're going to return to the pre-antibiotic era. He told us all of this in 1945, if only we'd listened. Absolutely. Um, and so now we're this going is to my favourite to uh, the Lego part of the talk. <laughs> which we're going to use to um, explain antibiotic resistance. And um, I have a patient called Brie. This is Brie. Now, Brie's in the Dublin of Colours, and she has an Ireland jersey on her because Nula's from Cork. Yeah. So we couldn't so get... I'm quite insulted by this reading, really, but we're going to talk about that later over a glass of wine. That Cork at the back on the hurdles, but anyway, not to worry. Uh, we'll talk about that. So uh, Brie is a patient of mine, um, and she's in her um, early 30s, and... She comes to see me uh, about three times a year with the same problem. She gets cystitis. So she gets pain in, in, in the lower part of her tummy. She gets pain passing urine. She's up during the night. And um, I know, because we've sent samples to the laboratory, that she has a book called E. coli. You're going to learn a lot about E. coli during this talk in her urine. And I also know, because of the sample I've sent to the, to the laboratory, that this is an E. coli, which... Um, a, a commonly used antibiotic called trimethoprim, you, people might know it as ipral or monotrim, um, is actually going to kill that ball. No, can so, I disturb your ball, balls? Can I show them Eco? <laughs> Absolutely, do, do. She gets very excited about Lego. This is Eco. I spent all Sunday figuring out how to do Eco. Do continue. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I prescribe this antibiotic for three days, she gets better and she goes away. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, what happened was, she, she came to see me, the usual thing, I described her trimethoprim. She came back to see me two days later, and she said, Nuri, she said, I feel awful. She said, I, I said I'm shivering, I'm shaking, I, I, I feel nauseated, I, I, I am sweating, I, I, I really feel terrible. I've never felt like this um, following um, um, cystitis. And fair enough, I examined her, and she actually had a very fast heart rate, she had a high temperature, and, and she said, I'm getting pain up here, Nuri. 
And, and after examining her, I, just, I felt that she had um, a thing called pyelonephritis. So pyelonephritis is a much more serious infection where the infection is tracked from the bladder right up into the, into the kidneys. And it's one which we need to treat in hospital with um, a drip antibiotic or an intravenous antibiotic. So I organised for her to go uh, to Beaumont. Let's stretch it slightly because I really wouldn't have sent her all the way up to Dublin, but we're, we're telling a story here. And, um, and she was seen in the emergency department in Beaumont, and the junior doctors there concurred with my diagnosis, and they did exactly what they should do. They put her up on an intravenous drip antibiotic called Comoxaclave, which is the uh, policy, and they sent a sample of urine off up to Fildenma's laboratory. <laughs> but the following day, um, she was actually getting worse, and so they rang Fidelma and they said, listen, Fidelma, this patient isn't great. Have you any advice for us? So when I went to see this patient, so this was a patient of Nula's, young, healthy woman, self-employed, no reason to be suddenly this really, really sick. So she had a swinging temperature, her blood pressure was in her boots, her heart rate was really fast, and she looked really miserable. She was complaining of back pain. And the first thing I thought of was superbug. And the reason for that is the usual antibiotic that Nula prescribes that works, that she gives her for three days all the time, was didn't work. And now she used the second, or rather the emergency department doctors used the second line antibiotic. That wasn't working. So that to me, as they say, I sniffed a rat. So I would have started that patient on cover for superbug. So it would have been a drip antibiotic, and it would have probably been an antibiotic known as meripenem, which is one of our last reserve antibiotics because this was a young healthy lady, she was very septic, she was hit, hitting critical care if we didn't take action. So will I go back to E. coli first? Go back to e. coli Do you want to show them E. coli? Yes. Yeah. So, so Nula, Nula has spent a lot of time listening about this so she's just going to have to model it. So the first E. coli which um, E. coli looks nothing like this, obviously. It's not a multicolored bulk bulk made of duplo. But it's you know, basically what E. coli is is a bowel bulk. So our bowels we talk about in the second half are full of billions of bacteria. And E. coli is a really common bulk there. And it's minding its own business and it does no harm. And from time to time, specifically in women, it can move from the bowel to the bladder. And that's because of the anatomy of women, their urethra is shorter. And that's how you get cystitis. It's usually your own bugs causing the problem. So whatever's in your bowel causes the cystitis, i.e. the E. coli. So when Nula started giving, what do you give first line, by the way? Trimethoprim. So when Nula gives trimethoprim first line for cystitis, trimethoprim is an antibiotic that, let's say, sticks onto the orange block. So antibiotics have specific target sites on a bug. And when it sticks on, it can kill E. coli. So it falls apart. So that's effectively what antibiotics do. They bind to a very specific target site on a very specific bug and kill the bug. So when Brie went into the emergency department, they thought that Brie had the same E. coli and they prescribed Comoxiclav. And Comoxiclav is an antibiotic that binds to the red brick. So this brick here. So it's a different target site to the orange brick. But when it binds and sticks onto it, what happens to E. coli? It dies. So that's effectively what it does. The problem is, when your patient came into the emergency department, she didn't have the normal E. coli. She had a different type of E. coli. She had an E. coli that didn't have the orange block or the red block because clearly this very clever E. coli had had enough of getting killed. So now, no matter how much of your nitrofurantone you're going to throw at this, it ain't going to die. And no matter how much comoxiclav you're going to throw at this, they can't stick. So that's why this young healthy lady didn't get better. And that's why I had to prescribe the equivalent of Domestos to burst open the E. coli and die. So after I saw the patient, I came back the next day. And because I'm telling the story, I have to be right. 
So I was right. Because I came back from the laboratory and went, I'm great, haven't I? And I was. Because I said, no, everybody, I'm right. Because you don't have the E. coli of the orange block or the red block. You've got the super duper E. coli that doesn't have any of these sticky sides for these antibiotics. And not only that, it's now producing this enzyme called an ESBL, which we'll hear about in the second half. And this ESBL enzyme is, is thrown out from the bacteria and it chops up most of the antibiotics, apart from that meripenin last line antibiotic. So I was right, but it was terrible that this young, healthy lady ended up on a last line antibiotic. Um, so how do you think this might have happened? You know, why did this happen to this, this patient of mine? And I think it's a fair point, because when we talk about superbugs, a lot of the talk is about vulnerable cancer patients, not young, healthy people. And that's the reality now with superbugs. Of course they affect vulnerable people, but they also can affect young, healthy people. So one of the things you had said to me is you give nitrofurantone and she got recurrent cystitis. So there's a good chance what was happening is the E. coli that's millions in her bowel saw this nitrofurantone and was killing all their buddies. So it developed, well, Bob's your uncle, no more of the orange blocks. I'm going to get rid of that orange block so I can't be killed. So that could be one reason. Because she did been exposed to a lot of a particular antibiotic, the bugs in the bowel just got clever and developed resistance. Um, the other thing actually um, uh, that, that struck me about this patient was um, when you rang me actually, you said to me, is it possible that anyone else might have been given her antibiotics? And it actually uh, reminded me that she had actually been in Spain six weeks ago. And when she'd come home from Spain, she'd actually run me because she said, I got that cystitis when I, when I was out in Spain. And I went to see a doctor there. And look, I needed to make a note of the antibiotic that I got because I felt locked for six on this antibiotic. It was called Ciproxin. I had to take it for 10 days. And really, I just wanted it in my chart because I don't ever want to have to take that antibiotic again. Mm. Do you think that could have been a factor for Delmar? Yeah, it could have, because the more different types of antibiotics you throw at bacteria, the more likely they to develop resistance. And we've said that because bacteria have been around for billions of years. They're natural survivors, and developing resistance is what they do. It's a fact of life. It's just going to happen. So she's got her nitrofurantone, she's got her ciprofloxacin. There's a good chance over the years she may have had other antibiotics. So over the time, her bugs and her bowel have evolved to I suppose defend themselves against these threats. And that would be one explanation. She could have also picked it up in Spain because we've seen the maps of Spain, or she could have been on Holliers in Greece. Um, so and because of all of these places, or she could have maybe started buying antibiotics over the counter, and we'll talk about that later. So there could be lots of reasons why this young, healthy woman has a very resistant bacteria. So um what we're going to do, what we've tried to do here um, in the first part is actually give you an idea about the problem that we're facing with Superbox, give you a hint about maybe some of the things that we could do to try to combat them, and try to get to explain to you how antibiotic resistance develops. Um, so for the moment what we're going to do is going to take any questions at this stage, then we're going to have a, a short break, and in, in part two we're going to get you to meet individual Superbugs and give you some idea about what all of us can do to try to help combat this problem. Thank you. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about superbugs later on, but I think, Lula, we have to redress the balance, because not all bugs are bad. And we've already talked with Bree, your patient, that E. coli and there's billions of bacteria in the bowel that are useful for us. And bad news, everybody, is we're full of bugs. And our bowel has 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. <laughs> Apparently, our bowel bugs, our normal flora, weigh a kilo. I read that on a reputable site. And this normal flora is known as the microbiome. And other places bugs are, are on our skin. For example, there's a skin bug called Staph epidermidis, and it's important for the skin health. But let's go back to the bowel bugs. So these billions of bacteria that live in our bowel are really important for our health. They have an important role in nutrition, 
in digestion, and also they're a really important part of the immune system. They keep some of the bad bugs out. And you probably have come across probiotics. And probiotics are sold a lot. And there's a lot of discussion in the medical literature and also in the popular literature about the benefits or so on of probiotics. So look, what is a probiotic? Because there's also prebiotics. So what a probiotic is, is a live bacteria, not a single one, because they're tiny. And there's different types of bacteria that could be probiotics. Some are called lactobacillus. Some are called, um, are, um, I can't even remember the second one, blank one. But basically there's three or four main ones that are, are the probiotic bacteria. And their effect is very specific to the type of probiotic. And what a probiotic needs to do to be good is survive gastric acid, survive bile acid, and get into the tummy and do its thing. So you kind of think by ingesting good bugs it should be good. So I'd like to go back to the scientific literature. So in the scientific literature, the jury is out on lots of different causes, but there is some evidence that using probiotics to treat some viral gastroenteritis, like rotavirus, is beneficial, specifically in children, and also using them to treat less for prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Now that kind of makes a bit of sense, because antibiotics will kill off some of the billions of bacteria in your bowel. Um, so they've taken a probiotic to redress the balance makes a lot of sense. But the rest of the literature is very less clear-cut. So I think the hunch of everybody is, it makes some sense, but we need more evidence. And I suppose if you're going to buy a probiotic, be aware that those things off the shelf are not equal. So you need to see what's in it and how much is in it. And sometimes the cheaper products are cheaper for a reason. So I can present the scientific evidence, but I can also present a warning. Because like everything you take into your body, there's potential harm. So most of us that take live bacteria into our body, it's not going to do us any harm. But if you're immunosuppressed, you can't do harm. So Nula, if one of your patients, let's say, that had cancer or was on chemotherapy, took a live bacteria into their bowel, that could cause problems. Absolutely. And, and the thing about probiotics, and I think it's, it's, it's important um, that we make this clear, as scientists, we definitely think that there is something to probiotics, and we talk about a particular example where we, they know, we know they work very well. But there is an awful lot yet to be discovered about when we should be advising people to use them, which one we should use, and, 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 and which ones to avoid. So I think it's very important we give a very clear message here that we're very interested in this area, um, but at the moment, people need to be very careful in their use of probiotics. Oh, I remember that it was brevi bacteria. It's really embarrassing when a microbiologist is being filmed and they get a blank of the bugs in your bowel. But anyway, off note, I remembered Canada. Now, the warning is true because there are some case reports in the literature where immunosuppressed patients have taken probiotics and the bugs have escaped from the bowel into the bloodstream and caused have caused very serious infection. So I think the bottom line is you have to be careful what you take. Now, because you've all had your tea, I hope, I'm going to tell you what I think is a fascinating use of our normal flora to treat infection. I and think that's anyone who has a queasy stomach should leave now. <laughs> it's not. It's poo transplantation. And you've heard me right. So it's fecal transplantation. So one of the areas I'm interested in is an infection called C. diff, Clostridium difficile. So it's an infection, a specific infection that causes diarrhea. And when you get C. diff, a lot of people that get it, get it again and again and again. Now, if any of you have ever had diarrhea, you can imagine how debilitating it is. So could you imagine having months of this? It's horrendous. People with recurrent C. diff will do anything to, um, to improve. And in the last few years, there has been amazing good scientific publications of fecal transplantation. And it's a bit like, I suppose, bone marrow transplant? Yeah, it's a bit like any transplantation. So a donor will donate their normal flora, they donate their poo, into a recipient, a 
person that has C. diff. And there has been amazing results with this therapy. And it's been used widespread now in certain countries in Europe, actually for quite a long time, and also in North America. And it makes scientific sense because the person with recurrent C. diff, their normal bugs in their bowel aren't great. So they're not normal anymore. They're kind of full of bad bugs. And by giving good bugs back in, you're kind of repopulating the bowel. So there are just a few examples of the fact that bugs are good. But when we come and we, we, we talk about um, uh, superbugs, um, there's an important thing that we need people to understand. Um, we've Fidelis talked about the fact that you can have bugs on your skin. So we've got good bugs, bad bugs, and super bugs. But sometimes we can have bad bugs that live, that are on our skin or in our bowel, but they're not causing any harm. And if Dan's going to explain a bit more about this, we call it colonization. Yeah, so we've talked about that the good bugs are kind of our normal flora, and there are staph epidermis on our skin. But effectively what a bad bug is, isn't one of these scary looking things, but it's a bug that has the ability to cause havoc and cause infection. So by having the ability, for example, they might produce a toxin, and toxins we can all imagine would be, could be nasty. But by just simply having the ability, they don't automatically cause infection. So what colonization is, is a bad bug that has the ability to cause infection, but stays on your skin or in your bowel, minding its own business, causing no problem. So that's what colonization is. So probably the best example is Staph aureus. So Staph aureus is a skin bug, and it's lots of things it can do to wreak havoc. But normally, it can just live on your skin or in your mucosa, in your nose, and cause no harm. But if, for example, your immune system is breached, like if you have a drip or a wound or a cut, that bug, minding its own business on your skin, kind of goes, happy days, in I go, I've all my toxins, let's cause havoc. And that's the difference between colonization and infection. So bad bugs are bad, and effectively what superbugs then are, or any bug actually can be a superbug, it's a bug that's resistant to antibiotics. So, Fadema, um, um, I'd like if you could take us a bit on the A to Z of superbugs. Now, we're not going to go through 24 of them. We're going to focus in particular on, on, on three bugs. Um, and, but I think it's, it, it, it's an important thing to, for us to try to understand exactly what a superbug is and how it differs from other bugs. Now, as a microbiologist, we like big names, even if we can't remember the names of the normal floor. But let's move swiftly on with that. But we like talking about MRSA and VRE and ESBL and CRE and so on and so on. But I divide them into skin bugs and bowel bugs. So, probably the most loved skin bug is MRSA. Now, the SA bit of it stands for Staph aureus. That's the skin bug I was talking about. The bad bug that has the ability to cause infection. The M is the name of the antibiotic, methicillin. The OR means resistant. So effectively, it's a Staph aureus bug that's antibiotic resistant. So it does the same thing as normal Staph aureus. It can colonize, it can live on the skin and cause no trouble. Or, if it gets the opportunity, it can get in there and cause havoc. And like a lot of these superbugs, the antibiotic-resistant bugs, from our end, they're a little bit more difficult to treat. But this is not impossible to treat, but it's more difficult to treat. And sometimes, um, you know, a lot of you are, are familiar, um, you, you, you yourself, or you may know somebody who's come out of hospital and they were told that they have MRSA in their nose or MRSA on their skin. Um, and the advice is, you know, and I think sometimes I find patients find it hard to believe, oh, so Auntie so has got MRSA, oh, you know, what do we need to do? And the answer is, if it's just colonising and just living on the skin like that, it's not going to cause anyone any harm, provided you're careful that you wash your hands and that you don't have a break in the skin. Um, but it can cause harm if it gets a chance to gain entry in under your skin or in under your blood, into your bloodstream, and that's particularly can happen with more vulnerable patients, but not necessarily always with vulnerable patients, as Fidel is going to illustrate. Yeah, so we were trying to think of what's the best way of giving 
example. And when we were chatting about this, we thought, well, you know, a lot of the time what would be common for Nula is you might have a young patient that's been out horse riding, falls off their horse and does something to their leg. Let's say fractures one of the bones in their legs. So it has to go to surgery, so the drip is put in. And that's routine part of surgery. Now, let's say if two or three days later, that person notices that around the drip site, it's a bit red and infected looking. Usually what that means is the bugs that are either on their skin or have been introduced onto their skin have got in deeper because the drip is breaking their skin. It's a bit like having a wound. Now, if the bugs on their skin or have got into their skin because staff haven't washed their hands, or MRSA, that's how you get an MRSA infection. But it could be the SA bit, the staph aureus. It happens the same way. And the consequences for that young girl are that they end up on, on antibiotics. If it's the SA, we can use the flucloxacillin antibiotic, like they used in Norway. But if it's the MRSA, we can't use that. But we use a different antibiotic. And once it's there, it could escape into the bloodstream. The other thing with these skin bugs is in hospitals we can do a thing called decolonization, which sounds very dramatic. It means we're trying to get rid of somebody's MRSA from their skin and their nose. And that's by using shower gels and an antibiotic cream up your nose. And that's successful in the majority of times. But we do things in hospitals that NULA doesn't do in primary care, principally to protect the vulnerable patients themselves or the other patients. I mean, so what that means is that we, in hospitals, you may try to decolonize a patient, but out in the community, most of the time, we don't. Because if we practice good infection um, prevention um, and control measures, then that MRSA doesn't pose any risk uh, to anyone else. Um, so there's quite a, a difference in how we handle it in the community versus in the hospital and, with, and, and versus in a nursing home and with the type of patients and how vulnerable they themselves are. So we'll move from the skin to the bowel because we've talked a lot about bowels. So the two ones, well there's going to be a third one, a snuggle at, and a really nasty one in Nula. But the first one is Fiori. So it's the same principle. The E stands for the name of the family of bugs. These are enterococci. They're bowel bugs. They mind their own business. All of us have enterococci. The V stands for the name of antibiotic. It's called vancomycin. The or means resistant. So all of us have the E's in our bowel. But not all of us have the VORAs in our bowel. Now, when these guys cause infection, they, they, they don't really affect mo a lot of patients, but they do tend to affect very vulnerable immunosuppressed patients, which means I would see some of these patients in Beaumont, but you're not going to see them in primary care. The other one I wanted to introduce is bring us back. Where's Bree going? The double colours, yeah. The double colours. Um, now, Brie, I said, had an ESBL. So this was a bug that was producing an enzyme. So the BL stands for beta-lactam A's. The A's means it's an enzyme that's chopping up antibiotics. The ES means extended spectrum. The bottom line is that any bug that produces an ESBL enzyme chops up lots of different antibiotics, the penicillin-type antibiotics. And this is why Brie did not respond to the antibiotic I prescribed or the antibiotic that was prescribed when she went into hospital initially, because she has an ESVL bulb in her urine. And the other example that we could have given, where the consequences are not just to one person, but to two people, are young pregnant women are very prone to get Absolutely. cystitis. And because pregnancy, I suppose, is like an immunosuppressed state, they're more vulnerable to getting a sending infection. And if a pregnant lady has a normal kidney infections. Those are easily treatable in primary Very care. easily treatable. We usually give them amoxicillin, a, a which is another antibiotic that's very safe. Um, and we give them for slightly longer because they're, they're considered immunosuppressed. We give a seven-day course as opposed to a three-day course. But unfortunately, if they have one of these ESBLs, that's not going to work. So we're back to the, the, the more high-powered meropenem antibiotic. And this time, there's two patients here. There's the lady and there's her baby. And, it, and, it, and if, they, if, if, if a pregnant lady gets this infection that tracks up into the kidneys, then it's quite likely that she could go into premature labour. It's also quite likely that an infection could get into the lining of the womb, uh, with very serious consequences for the baby. So they're not untreatable, 
but it's like the pre patient, those first line antibiotics don't work. So you kind of have to be hot off the ball looking for clues for these. But I have an even scarier book because it's back to your question about what happens if we've no antibiotics left. And this guy scares me, not because he's lots of, of eyes and has a lurid green colour and Elena was doing dollar signs for some reason for CRE. But E stands for the name of the bacteria, the family of bacteria, they're Enterobacteriaceae. So my name is Fidelma Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick is my surname. So the Enterobacteriaceae are like the surname. The Fidelma is my first name, like my sisters have different names. So within that family, there's E. coli, Klebsiella, lots of other types of bug. C is our last line antibiotic, the carbapenems, like meropenem. Or means resistant. I don't want to see many patients with CRE infections because these bugs are almost untreatable. We've had a handful of people over the last few years in Beaumont with these infections. And in general, there's maximum two antibiotics that work. One are very toxic to the kidneys, and the other is a very old antibiotic that we haven't used in years. And that's probably why it's so resistant. So we've kind of scaled the bowel bugs up to the ultimate superbug. And this guy is here to stay, but thankfully not that common. And if we go back to John, who we met um, in the first um, half of, of, of this talk, remember John was in Greece and he ended up in a, on intravenous antibiotics or drip antibiotics for two weeks. Well, Greece has a particular problem with CRE. You really don't want to end up in hospital in Greece because if you end up in hospital in Greece, it's quite likely that you will get this bug in your bowel. No, it might just live in your bowel, it may not, it may not make you sick if you're lucky, if you're fit and healthy. But let's say, for instance, that John comes back and he actually goes to visit an, an old friend of his or an elderly relative who's in a nursing home. And while he's there, he has to help that, that, that patient maybe in and out of the bathroom. And maybe he's not so good with his own hand hygiene. It's quite likely that he could transfer that CRE book to his friend. And then it's very likely that this frail elderly friend could die. Um, and I suppose um, this is, you know, a very real and, and possibility with these superbugs. And I suppose before we scare the life out of you, Greece have enough problems. It's a great place to visit. <laughs> what we're saying is, if you're in hospital in Greece, you're, you're more vulnerable to getting these superbugs. And not everybody that gets them is going to get infected. So remember the difference between colonization and infection. And the problem with bowel superbugs is unlike MRSA, how are you ever going to get rid of one species of bacteria with those billions? It's really, really difficult. So in general, once you're colonized with them, you're colonized for life. And even the laboratory screening is very difficult. It's easy to take a, screen, a, a swab of your skin. How are you going to get an accurate sample of billions of bacteria in your bowel? So it's a tricky, tricky problem. So, uh, Fidela, where do we stand in Ireland? We've talked about Greece now. We know that has a particular problem. And we'll tell you some positive things about Greece later on. But where do we stand in Ireland with regard to all of these um, superbugs? Um, now, well, the first thing is we've been a bit depressing, so we better start with the good news. And there is good news, and this shows we can do things. So there's been remarkable successes in reductions in serious bloodstream infections with MRSA in Ireland. So in about 2004, about 40% of the SA bugs were MRSAs, now about 20%. Like, that's brilliant. And it's even better when you look at the map of Europe. Remember the map of Europe, red is high rates of super bugs, green is low rates. In 2003, we were in the red. I know we're not economically, but we were. And then look what happened, if I can ever get a clicker to work. We're now in the orange, so we're going the right way. But the Scandinavians are still much better because, of course, for 30, 40 years, they've been using much less antibiotics than all of us. So these kind of things don't happen overnight. But that's the good news. That's the end of the good news. <laughs> <coughs> the bowel bugs, the Enterobacteriaceae family, this is Klebsiella. So in 2010, we were in the green. We were great. In 2013, 
we're in the yellowy orange. We are not so great. This is not good. These folks are getting more resistant. And the badger, I don't have to say anything about that. We've the highest rate of VRE, bloodstream infection, in Ireland. Yes, it doesn't affect a lot of patients. But we are in the red. We're even worse than the Greeks. And the scary thing about it, actually, for them, is that we actually really don't know why. That's, that, I mean, that's the fact. We actually don't know why or we have the highest rate of VRE in Europe. And then we go for the ugly bit. So remember CRE was the orange thing with the lots of eyes and mad hair. CRE, 2010, Ireland are in the green. CRE, 2013, Ireland are still in the green. So we've nothing to worry about. Look at Italy. 2010, Italy are not in green. 2013, three years later, Italy are in the red. Now what this shows is once these bugs take hold, because they're bowel bugs and they spread really fast between patients and hospitals, they can become a big problem very fast. So we, cannot, we can follow the Italians for fashion, because actually that's a good thing, but we cannot follow the Italians in terms of COE. This will not be a good thing. <coughs> and this next slide um, um, is actually um, based on a slide that I put together when we were um, doing a, a lot of talks about Ebola and how Ebola and the potential for Ebola to spread um, around the world. And, and you know, we all we all are, are very worried about what's going on in Africa. And there's a lot of uh, fear that Ebola might spread to Europe. Um, but the fact is that 70% of the world is connected by two airline flights. Just think about what has happened in the last 30 years in Ireland. How often do we all hop on planes? How many of us have families or relatives scattered right around the world? We're flipping back and forth. And basically, these superworlds are hitching a ride. Look at how CRE is tracking up through Europe. So they're hitching a ride on our skin and in our bowels, and they're spreading. And they're spreading at a far more rapid rate than some of the infections that get a lot of media attention. So where is all of this heading for do you think? Well, just, just to make you even more depressed, remember the um, UK report? That was depressing enough. But let's go back to Beaumont. Do you remember that ward round I talked about? All those patients that were alive because of antibiotics. Without antibiotics, People that have routine surgery would probably die afterwards because I wouldn't have it because surgery would be too risky. Our cancer, our transplant patients simply wouldn't either have their treatments or would die of infection. And you know, like your vulnerable patients that come into me in hospital, actually they wouldn't even get there because you'd have no antibiotics to treat them with. So that's the answer to your question. It is a reality, not today, not tomorrow, but we have to do something now. And we'll talk about that later on, and because we don't want to leave you all depressed, it's not a good thing. And I suppose what I like to think about is, is the breed, the girl in the Dublin colours. You think I actually followed you, I don't, but I'm doing it to wind her up. So basically, if I said to you, Brie is self-employed, she's got a few young children, and her husband is also self-employed, and we said that Brie ended up in hospital for 10 days on antibiotics. Can you imagine the chaos that that's going to cause in her household? So having this superbook causes chaos for her and her family. It also costs the health sector money, because this is a young, healthy woman that 15 years ago got three days of a tablet antibiotic and never landed in hospital. She's now in a hospital bed for 10 days, getting additional procedures and additional antibiotics. And also, if she's off work, she's not contributing to the exchequer. So actually, this super bug problem is much wider than health. It's got ramifications for the entire of our society. And when we looked at this 2014 report, remember this was the one that asked the question, what would happen if we did nothing by 2050? I've told you about the 10 million deaths, but the world GDP would go down between 2 and 3.5%. And it would cost 100 trillion US dollars. I lost count of the zeros, but bottom line is 
this costs a lot of money. And all of this doesn't take into account the human cost. The human cost of a green and a family. So, what can we do? Um, we have to try to leave you with something um, positive that we can do. And I just take the, the time to there. <laughs> So I suppose this is an option. I don't think it's going to work. Um, um, and I suppose um, there are a number of things involved in trying to keep antibiotics effective for future generations. Because that's, that's why we're here. We're trying here to try to um, um, give you an idea about what we all need to do. And it's not just going to be any one person. Um, it involves you, the public. Um, it involves prescribers like myself as a GP, it involves prescribers within hospitals, it involves the government, and it also involves the much wider um, um, uh, uh, worldwide community. And you've you seen from what, um, uh, you know, we, we, we see about what, what things are actually being garnered with, within that to try to improve things. But really, it's everyone's responsibility. So, Fidelma, would you try to enlighten us as to what's happening on the world stage? Well, globally, as I said earlier on, there's, there's a huge, I think we're all waking up, um, and there's a, now a lot of global conversation. The World Health Organization has, has talked about this seriously and engaged, I suppose, the worldwide community, and even the rock stars of the politicians. Well, maybe he's not a rock star, the next guy. Um, <laughs> They've got involved, and that's really important because already in the questions we talked about what can we do, we're talking about motivating the pharmaceutical industry, getting better diagnostics. One country just can't do this. We need to do this globally as a society. And also the conversation has extended in this arena beyond healthcare to agriculture and food because that's what we're not talking about tonight, but it's an important part of the jigsaw. And I suppose nationally in Ireland, we are doing stuff. So the programme, the national programme that we led on, has done a lot of work trying to build on what other people have done. And last year at European Antibiotic Day, the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Veterinary Officer announced the start-up of a new intergovernmental, intersectoral committee to tackle antibiotic resistance. And that was between health and agriculture. And that's really positive. And what was even better is the presidents of the Irish College of General Practitioners, of the Royal College of Physicians and the CEO of the College of Surgeons all also came together because they started talking about educating prescribers, including the prescribers of the future. Um, so, um, the kind of things that we're doing with prescribers um, is we're trying to make it easy for them to do the right thing. This gentleman up here talked about, about um, whether you had um, uh, things within Europe and, and among the world and everyone's saying off the same hymn sheet. So what we're doing is we're trying to make it easier if you're working as um, a GP, if you're working in a nursing home, if you're working in a hospital. And access to information is the most important thing. Quick and easy access when you need it. So through um, the, the, the national framework that myself and Fidel have been working on, we have developed um, apps and we've developed easy access website. So if I'm a GP, if I'm out in, in, in a patient's home and, and I'm wondering, gosh, what, what's the latest guidance I'm prescribing for, for what I'm seeing in front of me? I take out my smartphone and I can look it up straight away. Same as if I'm in an out of hours centre. Um, the junior doctors walking around in Beaumont, they have uh, an app on their phone who tell, tells them the same thing. Um, so we've tried to make it very easy for prescribers to do the right thing. And when I talk about doing the right thing, you heard Fidelma talk about domestos. Um, and when it comes to antibiotics, um, first of all, we said antibiotics are very specific, and they're specific drugs which kill bacteria. But there are differences between the different types of antibiotics and the types of bacteria that they can kill. And people talked about this, I've asked about the side effects of antibiotics. And when it comes to antibiotics, um, what we're trying to get people to do is to use an antibiotic that's going to kill the bacteria that the patient is suffering from without causing harm to any of the good bacteria. So if we use Domestos, which kills all known germs, it kills the bad bacteria, but it also knocks out an awful lot of your good bacteria. Now sometimes you need it, like when 
Bree went into hospital and she had a resistant pox, so she needed Domestos. But to be honest, for most of the conditions that I see in general practice, fairy washing up liquid will do just fine. It does the job. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, encourage uh, prescribers to think very scientifically about what exactly is the bug that they're trying to kill. And that's along with trying to have better diagnostics so it's a bit easier for us to actually be able to tell what kind of bug it is and what kind of antibiotic will work on it so that we can use more of the fairy washing up liquid and reserve domestos for when it's really needed. I suppose, Lula, when I think of this, I kind of think of weed killer in the garden. So if you have weeds on your grass, you could use a weed killer that knocks out the entire lawn, or you can use a weed killer that just kills the weeds. So it's kind of the same principle. Very, that's a very good analogy, yeah. actually, for that. Yeah. Um, another thing that we've worked really hard on with the, within the public education um, and campaign is try, to try to get um, patients to understand what antibiotics are and what they're not. So antibiotics kill bacteria. They have absolutely no effect on viruses. So the vast majority of things that people come in to see me um, about with regard to infections, sore throats, earaches, coughs, colds, flu, vomiting and diarrhea and skin rashes are caused by viruses. And antibiotics have absolutely no effect on them. But patients come to me because they want to get better fast. And they want to get better fast because they don't want to miss work. They want their kids to be able to go to crash or be able to go to school. They want to feel right so they have to, because they have to stand up in front of an audience like this and give a presentation and they don't want to have a gravity sore throat while they're doing it. But unfortunately, for the vast majority of those infections which are caused by viruses, the antibiotic is actually going to do no good. And what the patient really wants to do is they actually want to feel better. Um, but the symptoms that they have are that they may have pain, Antibiotics won't relieve pain. Pain is relieved by taking paracetamol or ibuprofen, some type of painkiller. They may be feeling feverish and sweaty. Antibiotics do nothing for fevers. A fever is actually treated by, again, taking paracetamol or ibuprofen. So in actual fact, with most of these infections, apart from the fact that you can get better by yourself using your own immune system, um, the symptoms that you're suffering from, the pain and the fever, will actually be treated by um, paracetamol and ibuprofen and not by antibiotics. And all the antibiotics will do, if you take them, if you've got a viral infection, they're going to give you what this lady pointed out, they're just going to give you nasty side effects. And for every antibiotic that we use when it's not necessary, we are contributing to society's growing problem with these superbugs. And that's really important um, uh, that uh, patients understand that. Um, sometimes as a GP, the easiest thing for me to do would be just to write out a prescription for an antibiotic. But, and, and this is where we need patients to engage with us because, you know, uh, we do know that sometimes patients actually expect to get antibiotics. And actually when we worked together, we did a survey in 2011. And remember I said we asked the question of Irish adults how many people had taken an antibiotic in the last year. And I was genuinely surprised by this. Like one in three, I think, is a lot of people. Um, and then we said to them, um, next slide there, Colette. <laughs> um, which I, I thought one in four falsely believe that antibiotics prevent colds from getting worse or will speed up the recovery. And I've already said that antibiotics are very specific medications that don't work on viruses, they work on bacteria. So we knew from the start that there was misinformation out there. That's fair enough, I'm not an expert on cholesterol, but it was up to us to try and redress that balance. The other thing is what Nuna was alluding to is over a third said that by the time they were sick enough to get to Nula, they expected an antibiotic in return. Now, what that is said to me is they were equating good value for money by getting a prescription. So what we were trying to do was redress that and say, actually, the best value for money you can get is the best medical advice, which may be not to take an antibiotic and go home and take your ibuprofen for your, your fever. Absolutely, we need people to understand that we all have actually very good immune systems and we can recover ourselves from viruses 
And in fact, even from a lot of bacterial infections, the milder ones, we can recover better ourselves using our own immune systems and really reserve antibiotics for when they're absolutely necessary. So, what can you do? This is the, 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 the final swan song, swan song that we're going to leave you with. But I suppose the first thing is we want everyone to reduce their risk of infections by staying healthy, getting some exercise, eating well, and getting plenty of fresh air. We also need people to actually take any immunizations that are appropriate for them. So use the childhood immunizations, use the immunizations we're now giving teenagers, and as people get older, or if they have particular um, uh, uh, diseases that suppress their immune system and make them more vulnerable to infections, we then have immunizations for flu, for pneumonia, uh, for shingles, lots of various different immunizations, and we need people to actually avail of those. And the other thing is we need to practice good general hygiene, not when you have an infection, but just in the home. Um, we're not at the barbecue season yet, but every year we see a big rise up in vomiting and diarrhea when the weather gets better and the barbecue comes out. And why is that? Because people are handling the chicken, they're handling the raw meat, and they're not being good about washing their hands and having different chopping boards with different things. They're throwing the burgers on the um, barbecue and they're not making sure that they're properly cooked. And people get infections. And then they come to me and then they start looking for antibiotics to get them better. And it goes on and on like that. Um, the second thing is that we need people to get informed. And this is something that we became aware of um, during um, our public ed education campaigns and the feedback is that nowadays when somebody gets sick, their first part of call is often Dr. Google. So we decided that we'd launch the alternative to Dr. Google. Um, and this is a website which we launched in November of this year. And it's had over 110,000 hits to the website so far. And what it is, it's produced by the HSE in conjunction with GPs and pharmacists. Um, there's no advertising on it. And essentially, it gives the advice that would happen if you came in to see me. So it takes um, colds, coughs, ears, flus, rash, temperature, throat and tummy. And if you have it or your child has it, has it, it tells you what to look out for, what you can expect, what you can do yourself, and when you should seek help. And it's supplemented by uh, video clips done by myself and a couple of other GPs, by Fidelma herself, and by pharmacists. And so it's free information, you can go back to it as often as you like, and it supplements a lot of the stuff that I do every day in general practice. And it also leads off into the HSC A to Z, which is a superb um, A to Z of all sorts of um, things besides infections, and it leads you off into that for more information. This is a slide which we developed um, in our very first actual um, information leaflet about antibiotics and what they do and what they can't do. And in my surgery, we actually have an audiovisual system inside of the waiting rooms. And this is the slide that people comment on all the time. They come in and they say, Gosh, Lula, I never realised that you can cough for three weeks um, after a viral infection. I never realised it takes that long to get over a sore throat. And this slide, I mean, I've been amazed at the impact of this slide. So people, you know, there's, uh, people have this um, myth that after X number of days, if, if I still have symptoms, I must need an antibiotic. So this slide in particular is going a lot um, of way towards addressing, we need people to know what is the normal course of illnesses so that they know when they can expect to get better and when they might need to seek help. Um, and it's also very important that we educate, as well as educating the doctors of the future, we educate the patients of the future, we educate our children. And this is a fantastic um, uh, free uh, web educational resource. Um, it was developed in Europe. Uh, it was very kindly translated into Irish uh, by some of the HSE workers um, in, the, in Galway. Um, because to get anything onto the um, uh, education uh, forum in the Department of Education, it has to be in Irish. And it's available um, to all schools. 
And what it has, it's got online uh, video games, it's got classroom activities to teach kids both in junior school and in senior school. So they're aimed at the six, seven year age group and also at the T1 year age group. And it teaches them all about good bugs, bad bugs, viruses, um, antibiotics, when they should be used, when they shouldn't be used, all about hand hygiene, and it really is a fantastic resource. So if you were to do one thing from today, if any of you have children or grandchildren, try and get this put on to the SPHE um, curriculum in, in your school, and you will be, be doing a great thing um, uh, for the future of society. And Fidelma, I mean, as a microbiologist, I mean, obviously we do give antibiotics, I do prescribe antibiotics, and there are times when it is appropriate to prescribe them. But I'd like to ask Fidelma, as a microbiologist who knows a lot more about bugs than I do, what are the do's and don'ts about antibiotics once they've been prescribed? So, just remember, antibiotics save lives. They're there for a reason. And the first thing is you take them exactly as prescribed because antibiotics work differently. If it says three times a day, it's designed to be taken three times a day, so there's enough antibiotic in your bloodstream constantly. Otherwise, if you skip the middle dose, what's going to happen is you have enough antibiotics to kill the bug, you skip the middle dose, it goes down, and then you take the next dose. And what's going to happen in the middle when the bugs get used to the antibiotics and aren't killed off? They develop that resistance. So that's the first thing, take them exactly as described. The second thing is finish the course. Because I am, as everybody's found out earlier on today, the most impatient person in the world. So it, I can understand that when you feel much better two days into a course, what you want to do is stop the antibiotics, but don't. And the reason for that is, as you feel much better, probably about 90-ish percent of the bugs are killed. So that's why you're feeling much better. But there's 10% left. And you need the rest of the course to kill off the 10%. Because if you don't kill off the 10%, what's happening? They've got use of the antibiotic. They're going to develop resistance. So you either get a resistant infection now, or it hangs around in your bowel or somewhere on your skin to cause havoc later. So finish the course. Don't save for later. Do not share antibiotics, because you will be doing harm, because they're so specific. The antibiotic that works for your kidney infection may not necessarily work for somebody else's kidney infection. We saw that with the green example. And lastly, when you're abroad, shop for shoes, for bags, for clothes, not for antibiotics. First of all, you've no idea the quality of things you're buying. And second of all, they are so specific. Why do you stop piling antibiotics? And it's interesting, when I say this, a lot of people go, oh no, I'd never do that. And yet when I ask people, what are you doing? Oh, I might buy a few antibiotics and wherever I'm going, because they're much cheaper. Those pharmacists and those doctors are robbers. <coughs> but actually there's a good reason why you should never stock up on antibiotics. You could be doing yourself harm, or you could be doing your loved ones harm. Absolutely. And I mean, one of the reasons why, remember the European resistant maps that we showed you, that the southern European countries were much worse? That's because... I mean, I'm sure many people here have been to Spain and Portugal and Italy and Greece and you see these signs because you can walk into a pharmacy in these countries and you can buy antibiotics. And that's partly the reason why they have uh, such a problem with them. And the other thing that is really important is that we actually prevent the spread of infections when you have an infection. Okay? So I mean, this slide here just shows you. I mean, we've been talking about bugs. We know about COVID and bugs. We'll all be kind of getting a little bit creepy later. But this just shows you by numerous just how many bugs are actually around on your hand, okay? So you can imagine um, that if you were coughing or sneezing and if you cough into your hands without a tissue and if you don't actually, you know, put that in the bin and then wash your hands, um, what's happening is the next thing that you've taught you transfer bugs there and someone else picks up those bugs and think of all the door handles and all sorts of things. It really doesn't bear thinking about. So hand washing to prevent the spread of germs and being very careful if you're coughing or sneezing um, to cough into your elbow or cough into a tissue and uh, to bit it and then actually to wash your hands. That's so important. And you know, Fidelma has talked about in hospitals how with MRSA they're very, very careful. We all know now you know going into hospitals, you're always people are washing their hands, people are isolated, you know, have these super bugs. But the people who are out in the community who have bugs in their skin are when we have infections. We're spreading those infections because we're not practicing good old-fashioned hand-washing. Um, now, 
so that we don't leave you on a totally bad note, there are some signs that some of the work that myself and Fidelma have been doing is actually um, uh, 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 proving positive. So these are um, the antibiotic consumption rates um, in the community. And you can see in 2014, they're actually starting to fall off. Um, so during 2014, we've actually succeeded in reducing the overall consumption of antibiotics in the community. And more importantly, we've had quite a dramatic fall off in one of these domestos bugs that I was talking about. And this is Comoxiclave. Now, Comoxiclave is actually something that is very much prescribed, has been very much prescribed in general practice. Uh, but in fact, it, it is not a first line drug for the vast majority of conditions that I see. And so this is something where we need you, the public, to actually listen uh, when you, and, and engage with your doctor because you may say, oh, look, I always get antibiotic X and it always makes me better. But if your GP says, yes, I do understand that that's the case, but because that antibiotic um, can contribute to antibiotic resistance, what we want you to do, and the national guidance now says, is that you should take antibiotic Y instead. So if your doctor is suggesting a change from what you normally get, we just ask you to please listen to your doctor because we need to move more towards the fairy washing up liquid, which will do the job just as good, um, but it's going to protect your, your, your good bugs and, and reduce the risk of you getting bad bugs. So I suppose, where are we now? The control free cast to take back over. So look, have the super bugs won? Well, not yet. We are where we are. We can't reverse what's happened, and bugs are clever. They've been around for billions of years, and developing resistance is what they do. And really, we all have a role. But what we'd like you to leave you with today is that antibiotics are useful medicines. They have transformed medicine, and you've seen those dramatic reductions in mortality. And it still amazes me in Beaumont. I prescribe antibiotics every day, because that's my job. And I'm still amazed when I see somebody one day and they're literally absolutely in bits, high temperature, blood pressure in their boots, and you prescribe an antibiotic and the next day they're sitting up going, how are you? And that's just fabulous. So it's amazing, but we have to preserve this for future generations. And yet, yes, the rock stars of the world are talking about pharmaceutical companies and better diagnostics and agriculture is getting involved. But we've left you with four things that you can do. And the first is to keep healthy. And remember, within keeping healthy is doing the stuff we're not really good at doing. Exercise, eating well, hydrating ourselves, getting the vaccinations we should get, and also proper hygiene around the house. The second thing we said is get informed. We live in this most amazing age of the information super age. But some of the sites are on the dodgier side of normal. So we've provided you with some sites that are useful, but there may be other sites that you find useful too. Thirdly, if you do get antibiotics, remember exactly as prescribed and finish the course. Don't share and handbags and shoes only, for the boys included, when you go to Spain and Greece. And then lastly, if you do have an infection, wash your hands and cough, and when you're coughing, use the tissues. Before we finish, it's very important to acknowledge two very important people who are now experts on the Superbugs, so they're six and a half and seven and a half. Um, Maeve Murphy from the Heritage Collection went scouring the archives to try and get our death records, and we really appreciate your help. And then our colleagues, Ed Smith, Martin Cormack, and Rob Cunning, and Karen Burns, because they provided some of the slides. So we leave you with some useful websites, and we're very happy to take questions for the final 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Superbugs are here to stay, and just remember what a superbug is, is a bug that's resistant to antibiotics. So it's more difficult to treat. Um, so we are where we are. We're, no, we're not any worse than the Mediterranean countries, but we're not as good as the Scandinavian countries. And what we were talking about tonight was that everybody can have a role. International policymakers, governments, prescribers, agriculture, the public, and our patients. So everybody has a role to preserve antibiotics for future generations. We can't go back to the pre-antibiotic era. 
I, as a GP, uh, can do my bit uh, in preventing the fight against uh, superbugs. Fidelma, as a hospital doctor, can do her bit. The vets can do their bit. The government can do their bit. But what we need is we need you, our patients, and everyone in Ireland to do their bit. And there are four key things that you can do. Stay healthy. Make sure you get all your immunizations, get informed. We have a great website called www.undertheweather.ie where you'll get information and tips on how to manage common infections like sore throats, rashes, coughs, colds, vomiting and diarrhea uh, by yourself and also information on when you need to seek help for yourself or a loved one. Or if you're suffering from any kind of infection, the best way to stop it, the spread from it is to actually wash your hands. And finally, if you are prescribed an antibiotic, it's really important that you take it exactly as prescribed, that you finish the course, you don't hang on to leftover antibiotics to give to somebody else. It's by everyone getting involved, everyone playing their part, that we will succeed in keeping antibiotics effective for future generations. Just in the lecture there tonight, I've learned that there's, there's different types of antibiotics for, for different ailments in the body, so it's not a one-fits-all. Obviously, the, the first thing to do is go and see our GP. They'd have to be sure that, it, that it's a bacterial infection, whereas we kind of know now that uh, a, a virus can't be killed by antibiotic. Mm -hmm.